A number of states are implementing, you know, so-called back-end responses, uh, basically moving up parole eligibility dates by 60 or 90 days, things like that. Uh, Kentucky has been doing that for the last couple of years. And basically the idea there is, you know, rather than have someone spend three years in prison, if they spend two years and nine months in prison and then are paroled, uh, you save that three months worth of incarceration costs. And realistically, you know, some people are going to make it, some people are not going to make it when they're released, but that extra three months in prison is not what's going to make the difference. So a number of states are looking at that. I think that's a relatively short-term solution to these problems, but nonetheless it does uh, result in some downsizing. Uh, a number of states are looking at dealing with the issue of parole revocations. You know, what's doesn't get a lot of attention is that uh, an increasing source of growth in the prison system in the last 20 years has been people out in the community on parole. States like Kansas and Michigan and others are now basically saying, you know, we need to give some oversight to the parole officer in how they handle those situations and we also need to develop a system of graduated sanctions so that the first response is not necessarily to send somebody back for two years, but how do we get uh, put tighter supervision, deal with some of the underlying problems uh, so that we have uh, sort of a stepladder before someone is sent back to prison and try to deal with the revocations that way. And we've seen some very impressive results in some of these states by making more options available, by having oversight. Uh, it can really make a difference in how many people are admitted to prison. There's two potential problems. One is that you don't, you know, it's common to say, well, it costs $25,000 a year or something like that to keep somebody locked up in prison. But if you let one person out of prison, you don't necessarily save $25,000 because there's the fixed cost of running a prison. If you have a 500 person prison and now you have 499, you still have the same number of guards, the same number of administrators, same number of uh, healthcare workers and all that. So it's not until you close an entire prison or at least a wing of a prison before you save any substantial amounts of money. And a number of states have been reducing populations but have found a lot of resistance from uh, prison towns across the country, often in rural areas that don't want their prison closed. They come to depend on it as a source of employment. So it's a difficult problem, but uh, I think if policymakers want to save money, they have to figure out how they're going to handle that problem. The second problem potentially in the budget cuts is that uh, many uh, executives are now looking at saving money on prison costs, uh, sometimes by letting people out of prison uh, earlier than they might have otherwise gone out, but without increasing services and supervision on the outside. So if you take a person who's been locked up for a few years, uh, had poor connection to the world of work before he or she went into prison, uh, difficulty in finding housing, unless they have some good support on the outside, uh, the chances of them making it are not great. So uh, if we cut drug treatment programs and employment assistance and, and other services like that, uh, it's a real risk of becoming a revolving door. We seem to save money at first by releasing people from prison, but so many people are going to fail, uh, it's not going to get us very far. So what we need to do, I think, is to take some of those savings, target that to community services, community supervision, uh, to increase the odds that uh, people who are released can remain safely in the community, can get reconnected to the community. Uh, that's the, the way to really save money in the long run. In the 1980s and 90s, been a massive prison building uh, program in upstate, rural, small town New York. Um, you know, many of those small towns had come to believe that the uh, building a prison was their uh, only hope at, uh, you know, economic salvation, essentially. And the research around the country on rural prisons is actually not very encouraging. Towns that build prisons uh, for a whole variety of reasons uh, actually don't necessarily improve their per capita income and reduce unemployment compared to other alternatives they might have chosen. But nonetheless, 
once they've got a, pro, a prison there and they've got you know however many uh, employees uh, working there, uh, they're very reluctant, very resistant to to letting that go, and they often have a lot of political clout in state legislatures. Uh, so it's uh, with a lot of uh, push and pull uh, that the governor of New York is now starting to close some juvenile institutions, some adult institutions. Uh, you know, I think the real challenge is, uh, in some ways, it's been setting up, pitting up low-income communities and urban areas against low-income communities and rural areas. You know, the bulk of the prisoners are coming from urban areas and, and disadvantaged communities and now going to upstate rural prisons that are disadvantaged also. And so we really need to look at, you know, what forms of economic development uh, would be appropriate in both those communities, both to, you know, prevent crime in the first place, create opportunity, and not make a community dependent on, on prison, uh, you know, as a means of economic development. You know, criminal justice is sort of the, the end of the line, basically, you know, after a whole set of social institutions in far too many cases have sort of failed to provide opportunity, failed to deal with problematic behavior, and, and as well as, you know, individuals making bad choices, then we, we have the criminal justice system comes into play. The war on drugs is approaching it, uh, by and large, as a criminal justice problem, uh, rather than one that should involve prevention and treatment. Now, there are significant issues of prevention and treatment, but they're very limited compared to the scope of the problem, uh, and it's much more expensive to deal with a problem as a criminal justice problem. We've got the cost of police and courts and corrections that kick in then. It's extremely expensive to deal with it that way. You know, as uh, we see some of these kinds of programs, treatment programs, prevention programs uh, being cut, uh, it just sort of exacerbates that whole problem. It sort of forces more of the problem to be dealt with uh, down the road as a criminal justice problem. Its most important contribution may be the symbolic uh, effect that it has on, on the political environment. Uh, you know, it's not that we have such a shortage of ideas about how to approach public safety in better ways. We can always use more ideas, but, you know, there's been a lot of people looking at these things for a long time. I think in many cases we know how we could be doing things better. The problem has really become a political one that uh, far too many political leaders of both parties are, are very nervous, very scared that uh, if they're somehow portrayed as being soft on crime, whatever that might mean, uh, their political career is going to be in jeopardy. And so what we need to do, I think, is to give political leadership uh, a sense of comfort that they can do the right thing and at the same time not suffer any political consequences for doing so. And so. The right on crime movement by, you know, uh, having, you know, very high profile, very conservative leadership, uh, you know, as its public face, uh, I think helps to send a message that, uh, yes, you can be conservative, you can be concerned about cost effective approaches to public policy, and if you are concerned about those things, then actually uh, doing public safety in a different way, uh, dealing with mass incarceration, looking at community building, looking at different approaches to how we uh, get at problems of substance abuse and other kinds of crime uh, actually makes sense.